I'm going to try to do the whole chapter, but you know. <laughs> and actually, the way this chapter goes, this one and the next one sort of go together, so I can break it off whenever I need to. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we're just saying you overwhelm our hearts with love. It's an amazing thing. But you've done something else with our hearts. While overwhelming us with your love, Lord, you have poured out your love into our hearts in the person of the Holy Spirit that you've given us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Just more proof that you love us with an infinite, never-ending, and thankfully never-changing love. You know, Jesus, there's been so many times when I've done things and said things and thought things I'm ashamed to say that if somebody had done that to me, I would have changed my mind about loving them. But you never have. Give us your heart tonight. I especially want to pray tonight for those who have been wronged in this world. Those who are victims of the sin and wickedness of other people. I want to pray tonight for those who love you, Lord, but they don't really get to enjoy the height and width and depth and breadth of your love because there's so much going on in the background of their lives that they just can't let go of the hurt and the pain. Tonight with Joseph's story, teach us, O oh Lord, a better way. I pray as unlikely as it is that if there's anyone here that isn't born again, they're not yet yours, or perhaps anyone listening online, Lord, if they haven't surrendered their heart to you, that tonight would be a night that would change it. And Jesus, we know you're working in the background in all of our lives. We can't see you, but we know you're there. So have your way in every heart. May we bring you honor and glory. We want to run to share the message of your fame, Lord. We sang that too. May our running begin tonight for your glory. Amen. Have you ever been in a place maybe where you're fantasizing about somebody who's done something really, really bad to you and you thought, well, if only I could get him if I had the authority, if I was in the right place at the right time, and I could turn the tables on him, and we just think, oh, that kind of revenge would be so sweet, so beautiful. I'm ashamed to admit to you, and I've told you the story about my breakup with my business partner before I got saved. Well, even after I got saved, I used to fantasize about him being dead. He was a pilot, and every time I would read in the local newspaper that there was an airplane crash, I would think, maybe it's him, and he's going to get his. And then I would think about being in a public place and being able to embarrass him and humiliate him. Well, I'm not proud of that. Even after I was a Christian, when I should have known better, I don't know about you, maybe I'm the only one, but my flesh was crying out for vengeance. Well, thankfully, in our story tonight, <clears throat> such is not the case with Joseph. He is in a position of power and authority. And tonight, as he encounters face-to-face -face the very people responsible for 13 years of being sold into slavery and being a prisoner, of feeling forgotten by God, forgotten by everybody else, he looks at his brothers. And well, let's just say that his heart is a lot more charitable than mine was, probably more than most of ours is. However, tonight we can learn to be like Joseph. Verse 1 said, When Jacob learned 
Now, what's happening here is God's plan is coming into focus. Now, if you're Joseph, it didn't look like God had a plan. We've talked about Joseph and how he wasn't bitter, how he always kept his eyes on the Lord. But honestly, because he's a human, we know that he struggled. He struggled with the whys, and I don't deserve this, and it's not fair. The same things that we struggle with even now. But as we begin tonight, God's plan is coming to fruition. So when Jacob learned that there, was a, that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Now to Jacob, this just makes sense. He's old, he's got Benjamin, he's got other wives in the picture. So he, his grown sons, they're men. By this time, the, the sons are in their mid-60s. And he says, go fix this. Why are you just standing around doing nothing? And literally, this says in Hebrew, why are you looking at each other with puzzled faces? Now, this is important. There is a reason that they're looking at each other with puzzled faces. We're going to see tonight that their consciences are gripped by and with consumed by guilt. Guilt is an absolute killer. For those of you carrying around guilt from your past lives, you got to lose it. You, you've got to lose it because guilt will hide from you the blessings of God. They'll be there. They're available to you, but you won't see them. You'll miss them completely. And Joseph's brothers are riddled with guilt. Now, no doubt, they didn't talk about what they did to Joseph openly. It was one of those things that you did a long time ago and you tried to push it way, way, way down in the background and yet it was always there at the surface. And we're going to see that guilt come bubbling over tonight and in our next couple of studies as well. But now we've got Egypt, the Nile having failed, grain, we'll see, I think it's verse 5, even in Canaan, it's unavailable. Egypt is the only answer. So Jacob thinks, well, it makes sense. You men, you go do something about it. Now, why would there be a puzzled look on their faces? Well, I believe it was because they knew that Egypt was probably where Joseph ended up. Their last trip to Egypt, they didn't want to go back. Joseph is there. That's a part of my past that, that I just want to forget about. I don't want to think about it. It hurts too much. And we're going to find tonight, and I hope some of you find tonight, that the more you try to push all of that stuff in the background and don't deal with it honestly before God, the more difficult it's going to be to move on with God. And I think they looked at each other when Jacob said, go to Egypt and get us some grain. I think they looked at each other and sort of gulped and thought, well, I don't think we should go there. Guilt will be with them because they don't deal with it. Guilt will be with you if you don't deal with it. For the sons, it'll be with them throughout this chapter and the next. And it is a key theme all the way to the end of the book of Genesis. Their consciences have been searing since they returned to their father with the lie that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. And now Egypt, just hearing that word, would send shivers down their back. Donald Gray Barnhouse wrote, the word Egypt in their ears must have sounded like the word rope in the house of a man who hanged himself. That's what's going on here in the background. Please take note, you cannot run away from conscience. And especially if you are a believer, and we here tonight, we're believers, you can try to forget about it, you can try to, to, to run away from it so that you don't have to deal with it or the consequences of your actions, but you cannot run away from your conscience. Jesus will always be there. Remember, he's everywhere, his omniscience, everywhere at the same time. 
And you can run and you can run and you can run, but you can find out that he runs faster than you. That's what happened to me when I got saved. I was running away. And it didn't matter where I went. It didn't matter what I did in my mind to try to, to rationalize the things I had done. I couldn't run away from my conscience. So while they never talked openly about it, as I said, they never really forgot it either. Now what they didn't know, because these sons did not know God. They're patriarchs, the promises are theirs, but they didn't know him. They're guilty of so much sin, and there's so much flesh, and we've studied it all throughout Genesis. But the one thing that they didn't know that they should have known, given their pedigree, the one thing you should know, given your relationship with Jesus Christ, is that at this very moment, God was in the middle of hatching a plan that could eliminate guilt from their life for the rest of their lives. In chapter 50, in this book, Joseph is going to say, when they think he's going to kill him, he's going to say, no, it, it's okay. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And God's plan comes into focus for Joseph. The problem is that these brothers, well, these brothers, they wouldn't let God's plan come into focus in their lives. They could have been set free from their consciences. But they thought ignoring it, pretending it away, would be better. Here's some practical advice, and then we'll move on. When your conscience is bothering you about something, deal with it instantly. Don't let it simmer. That's when the devil gets involved. When your conscience is bothering you, deal with it immediately. So verse 3 says, The ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. Now you remember, this is Joseph's full-blood brother, the only other son of the wife that Jacob loved. Benjamin is now probably 25-ish years old. Joseph hasn't seen him since he was maybe three or four years old. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. Now, we need to remember a problem that Jacob had. Remember when he was trying to be comforted, and he refused to be comforted. He said, in mourning, I will go down to my grave. More than 20 years has passed, and he's still mourning still refusing to be comforted. I'm not suggesting that the death of a son or the death of a child ever goes away. That's not the case. But, but we learn to move on. We learn to serve God even in the middle of our grief. We learn that the joy of being with Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit still available to us sort of overwhelms and the grief gets less and less and less, but make no mistake, we grieve forever. This is a, a thing where we say, Jacob, this has been over 20 years. Get over it. It's not that at all. It, it's just that he's refused to seek God. Remember, Jacob wrestled with God. He knew him. Jacob had appearances of God to him. Jesus appeared to him and made him wonderful, glorious promises. Jacob knew him well enough to cry out to him and say, God, my pain, I can't bear it. And Jacob could have had the opportunity to have God overwhelm his heart with love as we sang about in our worship songs. But he didn't do it. And the problem with grief, the problem with allowing bitterness to creep in is it becomes part of who we are. And truthfully, some of us feel naked without it. We know how to respond if we're angry. We know how to respond if we're grieving or if we're bitter. But we're not quite sure how to respond in the freedom that God has given us. Sometimes it's just more comfortable. And I hope you understand this. It's something that makes no sense, but it's just more comfortable to hold on to your pain instead of letting go 
and giving God the opportunity to take you to be right in the middle of his plan. Jacob simply refused to be comforted. He's in that phase of life now where he almost expects something bad's going to happen every day. What's the point? A lot of us as believers, we get to that same place. And the enemy just steals the joy from us. And people don't want to be around us. Remember the joy of the Lord is our strength. Remember also that in his presence is the fullness of joy. And if we remember that, then we have the opportunity that Jacob refused to take advantage of. That's we can be with Jesus. And we can move on. We can move forward. Now, Jacob, I went to that, into that detail because we could have think, thought about Jacob, you know, well, well, who could blame him for being bitter? But in our story, who had more right to be bitter? Jacob or Joseph? It wasn't Jacob who was dropped into a cistern as his brothers planned his death. It wasn't Jacob who was sold into slavery. It wasn't Jacob who became a slave in the household of Potiphar. And even though God was blessing his work, it wasn't Jacob who was approached by Potiphar's wife and doing the right thing, he ran away. It was Joseph. And Joseph, throughout the entire time, the 13 years in Egypt, many of those years spent in prison, Joseph refused to be bitter. Joseph chose to trust God. Make no mistake, it is a choice. And even though he had more right to his bitterness, it was Jacob who held on to it. So Israel's sons, verse 5, were among those who went to buy grain, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now I think that's an important part of our story, at least as it applies to you and to me right here in 2021. You know, we have a tendency to believe that, well, if I'm serving God, if I'm doing what God wants, if I'm God's man or if I'm God's woman, then bad things shouldn't happen to me. Remember, bad things happen to everybody, saved and unsaved alike. There's a famine now, it's reached Egypt. When Egypt is in famine conditions, believe me, Canaan is much worse. There's no river in Canaan. A little tiny Jordan that you cross over except when it was at flood stage, wasn't enough to do anything. There was just no hope. And as bad as it was in Egypt, it would be worse in Canaan. And we need to resist this notion that the enemy and really, really bad Christian teaching always is bringing up that, well, you know, you just do the right thing and nothing bad will happen to you. God will always take care of you. He'll provide what we need. You know, we have a saying at Calvary Chapel where God guides, God provides, and he's always done that. But so many people take that to mean that, well, well, if God's leading, then we'll have an abundance of provision. It's not that. This is a test. This whole chapter and the next are a test for Jacob's sons. And in the same way, we get tested. God does some of his best work through trials and tests. You remember when Israel finally got into the promised land under Joshua? They found giants there. Enemies that wanted to destroy them. Enemies who, who wouldn't just sort of hand over the land. That's the same way for you and for me. There is an enemy that wants to destroy you. And he wants to destroy me. And he's going to do anything and everything he can, especially when you're right in the middle of God's will. Don't get discouraged when you find yourself being tested. God does a lot of really, really thorough cleaning of our hearts in the middle of tests and trials. Verse 6 says, Now that Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. I told you God's plan was emerging. Here it is. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Now, remember the dream of chapter 37? This is exactly what Joseph said would happen 
And now he is watching the fulfillment of this dream. His brothers are bowing down to him. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. Now stop there just for a moment. Can you imagine the emotion going on in Joseph? Can you imagine the stomach? Can you imagine the grated teeth? Oh, my brothers. I'm the most powerful man in the world. I could do anything I wanted to them, and they couldn't do anything about it. Well, remember, Joseph's not like me. He saw his brothers. He recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked, from the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Now, I, I said that his brothers are being tested. This is where the test starts, and this is Joseph. When your heart's right with God, you can hear from the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, Joseph's relationship with the Holy Spirit wasn't as intensive as ours is. But Joseph is a man who loved God. Joseph is a man who spent time alone with God when he was having difficulty. And when you spend time with God, you learn to be like him. And so Joseph now recognizes his brothers and with all of these thoughts coming into his heart and into his mind, the one thing he's thinking of is, I know God has a plan. And now my brothers are here. And maybe, just maybe, there can be reconciliation. So he's speaking harshly to them. This is a test of the brothers. That they didn't recognize him. Troubles some people because, well, how could you not recognize your brother? Well, remember, he's been in Egypt now for more than 20 years. But he's also the most powerful man in Egypt. They certainly didn't expect that. And his appearance would be completely different. Having ascended to the position of the vizier, he, he would have makeup on, eye makeup, heavy eye makeup. His head probably shaved bald. He would have had, if you've seen those old Egyptian movies, the Egyptians, while they didn't like facial hair, they, they wore these fake beards, usually made out of horses' tails or something, and they would, would be really small and narrow, and they would hang them from the bottom of their chin. And, and this just wasn't what they were expecting. And so they wouldn't recognize him. Of course, Joseph is sort of standing in the background, speaking harshly to them through an interpreter we're going to find as we get a few verses ahead. So they're, they're completely in the dark about the identity of Joseph, and yet he recognized his brothers. I love the fact that God always recognizes those of us who are really his. We can kind of steal away a little bit. We can backslide. We can do things that we know we're not supposed to. But God always recognizes us, and he's going to chase us. He's going to make us come to that place where we have to deal with him. And that's exactly what God is doing to the 12 brothers, the 10 brothers. And he's using Joseph to do it. Now, what Joseph's brothers are going to find out that what happened to him, to Joseph, has consequences, dire consequences. But they can't find out that God wants to free them from those consequences until they deal honestly with their own hearts. One of the reasons they can't recognize Joseph, remember, as a type of Christ, is because they weren't ready yet to see Joseph in his glory. And I point that out because this is a remarkable picture of Jesus that God has given us here. None of us are able to see Jesus in his glory until we deal honestly with our hearts. We've got to deal honestly with our past. We can't pretend God's okay with the stuff that we have done. You know, when we, when we sin against somebody, we've, we've got to make it a point to seek reconciliation, to ask for forgiveness, to stop making excuses. If you want to talk with Jesus, if you want to walk with Jesus, you've got to deal with the things in your past. God can't take you to the next place he has for you unless you've dealt with your failure in the places you've already been. You know, we talk so much about grace in the church, and I think that's appropriate. However, I think sometimes we hear grace so much that we forget that God is a holy, awesome, consuming fire of justice. 
And when we mess up, it's not enough to say, okay, well, God, you know my heart. What we really need to do is say, God, I blew it. I broke your heart. I hurt other people. I did things. I made excuses for them, but I did them. I'm guilty. Only when you're ready to deal with your past on God's terms are you going to be able to see Jesus in all of his glory. And I can tell you, I promise all of you that it's worth it. It's so worth it. When Jesus can come to you sort of unfiltered and say, I've been listening. I've been chasing. All I was doing was waiting for you to be honest with me about your life. If you're here tonight and there's sin in your life, stop playing around with it. Own it. Tell God you're responsible. It's your fault. It's not what anybody else did to you. Nobody else made you do it. You did it. And then say, I don't want to do that stuff anymore, Lord. What did the Apostle Paul say? What I want to do, I can't do. What I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me through this or from this body of death? And the answer for Paul is the same as it was for you and for me. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. He will come to you in all of his glory, giving you all of his righteousness, reestablishing the connection that you once had, only it will be better. But you've got to deal honestly with your past. You've got to deal honestly with your heart. When you think of yourself as, well, it's not so bad, or I'm not that bad, well, then the person of Jesus Christ is going to be hidden from you. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. Now remember, this is all a test. You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. Now, this doesn't mean that Joseph forgot. This just means that he understood that God was fulfilling at least a part of his dream, the part with Jacob bowing down will come later, but he was fulfilling a part of his dream right there. Joseph was saying, God, you told me this was going to happen. And I held on to that all of these years. Perhaps that's what kept him from becoming so bitter against his brothers. Blood or no blood, if they did to me what they did to Joseph and I was in Joseph's position of power and authority, well, I can promise you my brothers would have a tough week. But not Joseph. He recognized right now that God is doing something. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but when you recognize, when you can look around and see God's plans unfolding before your very eyes. When you, you have all these questions, and we all do. Why did that happen? I thought this was going to happen and didn't happen. Your expectations aren't fulfilled. And you're thinking, well, well, I don't know how much worse things can get. And then sort of the fog begins to lift. And you remember the promises that God has made to you. And you remember how good he's been to you. And then you're able to start discerning that, well, well, this person coming back into my life or this circumstance suddenly being resolved, you realize that God is in heaven figuratively shuffling the deck and you're getting all the good cards. Now, Joseph, who could blame him for all those years in prison and all those years as a slave? Who could blame him if he was angry and frustrated? But what Joseph is doing is saying, now I'm beginning to get it. When you can get to that place and you can see the hand of God beginning to move, believe me, it's a wonderful place to be because you know right then that you're in the perfect will of God. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Now think about this for a moment. As, as they're saying this to Joseph, Joseph is thinking, my father is still alive? I wonder if he's doing math. How old is he now? You know, and trying to figure, he's still alive? Imagine how thrilling that would be for him. I think maybe he shot a look. Thank you, Lord. My father's still alive. We're the sons of one man. 
And then this is the funniest in a sick way line in the whole chapter. Your servants are honest men, not spies. You know what they're saying to Joseph? Now remember, and I'm restating the obvious. They're saying, you can trust us. And Joseph is thinking, I don't think so. (laughs) What did Ronald Reagan say so many years ago? Trust but verify. That's exactly what's going on here. So the test continues. No, he said to them, you've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father. Now you think Benjamin. Benjamin is alive and Benjamin's okay. I haven't seen little Benji since he was three or four years old. And he's okay. And he probably tried to remember, how, how old would he be now? 24, 25 years old? But then he says, or they say to him, and one is no more. Now, if I was Joseph... And they said, and one is no more. I would say, you got another thing coming. This is when I would have revealed myself to them. Now remember, I'm fleshy, Joseph isn't. But this would be the opportunity when he could have said, oh, you don't think so. You think you could do that to me and get away with it. Not Joseph, because Joseph is looking for reconciliation. Joseph is recognizing the plan of God. If there are people in your lives that have hurt you so, so deeply and you see the hand of God moving to bring them to you, to reconcile with you, to to show off your relationship with Jesus before them, embrace it. You know, we Christians, we try to sound so spiritual. We say, well, I, I forgive them, but I can never forget. I mean, if we're going to be honest, what we just said is, Lord, I don't care what you forgave me for. I don't care what you've forgotten that I did. I'm never forgiving them. I think Jesus told a parable about a debt that makes the same point. He knows God is moving. He sees this plan unfolding. Instead of being resistant to it, he's embracing it because here's what Joseph knows by now. He knows that, well, from prison, he's now the most powerful man in the world. That had to be the hand of God. And what he knows and what I want you to know tonight is that whatever God has for you, no matter your initial reaction, whatever God has for you is the best possible thing for you and you don't want to miss not one bit of it. So now he's embracing it and one is no more. Joseph said to them, it's just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother come here. Now, the ten brothers already know that Benjamin's not coming. After Jacob's grief over the loss of Joseph, he's not going to let Benjamin, the last son of his beloved wife, out of his sight. Here's your test. Bring your younger brother back. I'll find out if you're telling the truth. He says in verse 16, send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that... Your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And the idea there is that will be a death penalty. And then look at verse 17. And he put them all in custody for three days. Now, people are always trying to look for the significance of being in custody for three days. It's not anything related to Jesus being risen from the dead. All Joseph is doing is giving them an opportunity to be alone with one another and with God. That's all he's doing. Imagine the conversations between the ten. Now, we have a little bit of a picture of that conversation coming up. But while they're in jail, while they're in in confinement, it doesn't mean they were in a jail cell. They were just sequestered away from everybody else 
and they were left to their own. Can you imagine how difficult those three days were? I always think about the Apostle Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus. And after meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was blind for three days. They had to lead him into the city and put him in a home where he'd be safe. And they just shut the door, and he was alone. And people always say, well, that was the worst three days of his life. It wasn't. Those were the best three days of Saul's life. Because that was when he could deal with God. That's when he could really admit that his heart was to hurt God and God's people. Three days alone with Jesus will change you. Well, the brothers would have to deal with their consciences and their fear during these three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. Now, that's not an accident. This should have raised all of their eyebrows. Their consciences were so seared that they sort of didn't get the message. For I fear God. This is an opening for each of the brothers to say, You, you fear God? That's a, a very Jewish phrase. Joseph is saying, Hint, hint. I think he's probably looking at him going, I fear God. They should have run through that opportunity. They should, you fear God? Well, well, we fear God. Our father Jacob knows all about this God. But sometimes, remember I said earlier, guilt will keep you from seeing the blessing of God when it's standing right before you. It's the case here. They should be willing now to at least explore in conversation with Joseph about this God that he says he fears. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your younger brother, youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished. Remember the three days of conversation. Surely we're being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why the distress has come upon us. What they're saying is, look, God's getting even with us. Joseph's cries from that cistern would have haunted them for all these years. And again, they would do their best to sort of stuff it in the deep, dark regions of their brain. But, 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 but now it's all coming out. The guilt is coming out, and they know they're guilty. They know they're guilty. They know they, they need to be held accountable. And what they're saying to one another now is, this is God. We deserve this. This is because of what we have done. So... Flesh rises again. They start pointing fingers. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Send me at your fault. And, and, and it's, it's just not at all the way they should respond. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Now that is a statement of responsibility. We did it. We're busted. And now we're going to pay for it. They finally understand that without taking responsibility, their guilt remains with them. By the way, this is always the first step in getting right with God. We've got to stop making excuses for the things that we do. We've got to accept responsibility. And the way we do that is to confess. Now, I wish I had a little bit more time, but I want to talk to you about confession for a moment. We serve a God, we sing, and I hope you believe it, we serve a God who overwhelms our heart with love. Do you really know that you can trust him to forgive you? I mean, if we really knew it, I, I mean, we all know it intellectually, but I mean, if you really knew it from head to heart, then when you messed up, you'd be so quick to ask God to forgive you. You'd, you'd confess your sins. You'd come clean. The idea of confession isn't just saying, okay, I did it, but it's agreeing with God that it is a sin, that it's wrong. 
and that I'm responsible. It's not anybody else's fault. And if we really believe that God is good, then we would be so quick to confess our sins because we'd want to get out from under the oppression of guilt. The burden can be overwhelming. And that's exactly what they need to do. It says next in verse 23, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then turned back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Now the reason Simeon would be taken is because his is the hardest of all the hearts. He's the ringleader for the slaughter in Shechem. He was the one that was really, really angry with Joseph. So he, he wants to give his brothers time away from the one who can influence them. So he's going to keep Simeon and send the others back. After fighting through more than 25 years of pain, prison, anger, frustration, stopping short of being bitter or blaming God, he's finally now got to the place where he can find out what God's plan is going to look like as it unfolds. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack. Why would he do that? Well, grace is convicting. I don't know about you, but when I try to hold on to something that I need to repent, and God reminds me of his grace, man, that just rips my heart out. This is a picture of grace. It's also a part of the plan. And to give them provisions for their journey, after this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank. Isn't that a curious reaction? What would you do if you went to a grocery store and they gave you all your money back? You spent all your money and you gave it back to them and somebody said to you, you know what, we want to pay for this and they just paid you. I don't think you would say, my heart sank. And instead you'd say, praise the Lord, that's a good thing. Their hearts sank and they turned to each other trembling and said, what is this thing that God has done to us? One of the problems with flesh is when we're in the flesh, we always think it's God doing stuff to us instead of doing stuff for us or through us. And in this particular case, their hearts sank for the third time tonight. When you allow guilt to rule and reign in your life, you're unable to see the blessing of God when it's right there before you. That's exactly the case here again. When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, the man who is Lord over the land spoke harshly to us. When you're in sin, sometimes it doesn't feel like Jesus is speaking harshly to you. He is. But he's speaking harshly to you because he loves you. Here's what he's saying. He says, stop it. But you don't know what's happened to me. You don't know that I'm a victim of this or you don't know the trouble that I've been through. Jesus will look at you if you just will look into his eyes. He'll say, stop it. Come to me. Lay it all down before me. We want to pick it back up because as I said earlier, we get comfortable being a victim. We get comfortable in our pain and our grief. All we have to do is listen. The man who's Lord of the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we are honest men, we're not spies. We're, we're 12 brothers, sons of one father. One is no more and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. And, and I just, this is just me, I'm sure. But when they say this to Jacob, they're, they're repeating the story they told uh, Joseph, but, but when he said one is no more, it would be like an arrow going through Jacob's heart again. The son I love is no more. It would be a constant reminder. And 
looking back to verse 22 for a minute, Reuben is aware that their sin against Joseph is the cause of all their troubles. But now they're still not quite ready to be honest with their father. I mean, who can blame them? How do you tell your father that you faked Joseph's death and sold him into slavery? Now they're going to have to cross this bridge later. That's another lesson for us. You can put it off now. You can say, no, I can't deal with that now. But you're going to have to deal with it later because God is going to chase you to the ends of the earth. You run from your conscience, but you can't run far enough or fast enough. And the result is going to be that these ten brothers are going to continue to suffer. Then the man who is lord over the land said to us, This is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food for your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me. I can almost see Jacob sort of taking Benjamin and pulling him behind him and saying, Through my dead body, he's going nowhere. But bring your youngest brother to me so I will know that you are not spies but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land. I think it's strange that they didn't tell Jacob that this man who is Lord over the land also said he fears God. I I just think that's strange. I would think that's the one thing that I would bring to my father. I would say, there's still hope. There's hope. He fears God. We'll go to him. He fears God. We'll be okay. This is an opportunity for somebody to step up and demonstrate faith. As they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. Their father, Jacob, said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Remember, he's still the victim. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. I'm going to close here now in just one second, but please bear with me on this. For those of you who feel like God is always against you, you've got to break that cycle of thinking. Paul says that we're to renew our minds and we do that in the word of God. Renew means to think new, to think differently. You're not a victim. God is for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? You have to completely eliminate the promises of the New Testament to believe that God is out to get you or that God is angry at you or that God is, well, he's just not going to bless me. We've got to get out of that spiritual rut. It's the lives of the enemy. It's the lives of the people. I tell you all the time how much God loves you. And I know a bunch of you sit there and say, well, he doesn't love me. If he loved me, this wouldn't be happening or that wouldn't be happening. Or if he loved me, I wouldn't be alone. If he loved me, I wouldn't be sick. Whatever it is, you've got to break that rut. Because if you don't, then you too are going to miss the blessings of God that are right before your face. Reuben jumps in again, all in the flesh. Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. Why did he think that was going to make Jacob feel better? Okay, so I'll kill your grandsons, my grandsons, and somehow that's going to make me feel better. This is an insincere attempt to get Jacob to do what Reuben and the other brothers know needs to be done. They need to get food or they're going to die. Now I'm going to posit something and we'll kind of flesh it out a little bit in our study next time. I don't think Reuben would have made that offer had he known that the man that was lord over the land in Egypt was Joseph. What do you think he would have done? Okay, well, if if we go back and I'll bring him back to you, I'm going to have to tell you that Joseph is alive. I, I don't think he would have done that. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. He, once again, makes the others feel good. 
If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. This, this is just a really difficult place to be. We know he's going to relent. Never say never to God. I won't do this. Paula said, I'm not going to Texas. But remember, God has a plan. I'll close with this thought. Romans 8, 28, we all know it, don't we? We know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Let me close with the first three words. We all know. Do you really know that? I mean, do you really know it? We know the verse, but do you really know that in the middle of pain, in the middle of difficulty, in the middle of tests and trials, do you really know that God is at work behind the scenes for your good and for his will? We have to decide if we really do believe Romans 8.28 is real. And this is one of those places where there's no value if you're not honest with the Lord. You can say the spiritual thing, but if you're not being honest with the Lord, then he can't deal with your heart. In the middle of the pain that you're in now, for whatever the reason, do you really know that God is behind the scenes working all things together for your good simply because you love God. I'm going to ask you between now and next week and, and more practically to the end of the book of Genesis to wrestle with that verse and decide whether you really believe it or not. Because believing it is a key to seeing and experiencing the blessings of God in your life, even through really difficult times. The story gets better. We'll continue it next week. Father, we're grateful for your love. 